and welcome back to another episode of Interesting Stuff, the almost daily homeschool educational supplement where we dig in to topics that other people fear to touch, maybe because they're too alternative, maybe because they're just too big. And today we're looking at a big one. This is part two of the history of video games. Now, hopefully we're not going to overlap too much with part one. And if you haven't listened to part one, flip back for a second or for a few minutes and go and listen to how we got to where we are. And we've all had some relationship with games at some point in time in our life. Maybe for some people it was the more traditional board games and card games. But as technology has evolved, these games have entered our lives and appeared on computers, on consoles, in our pockets, on our mobile phones. They've been almost everywhere. Even my mother, I've caught my mother playing games on her iPad. So there probably is something out there for everyone. Anyway, let's dive into part two. Hold on to your hats. Here we go. And so we begin with the mobile element. Because mobile phones started becoming platforms for video games following Nokia installing Snake. Do you remember that? That the snake going round and round in circles on the screen and you just had up, down, like, you remember that? I remember that. Or am I just showing my age? I don't know. Anyway, um, Snake was installed by Nokia onto its mobile phones in 1997. As the game gained popularity with uh, people waiting for their class to start and waiting for the bus and waiting for the train and waiting for their doctor's appointment. Well, as the game gained popularity, every major phone brand offered time killer games that could be played in very short moments. Early mobile phone games were very limited by the modest size of phone screens that were all monochrome and and very pixelized and very limited um, with the amount of memory and processing power and very limited by the batteries as well. So they had to be really simple, but they were there and that was the beginning. And then compare that to what people have now, the powerful games that people play on their phones that they have in their pockets now. Quite an incredible technological advancement there. And so into our timeline, the Decade of the 2000s showed innovation on both consoles and PCs and an increasingly competitive market for portable game systems. I never really thought about this before, but um, I've got one of those Xbox 360s and um, it's pretty much a sort of pick it up and put it in your bag and go somewhere with it. It's really portable. Um, I never really thought of it as portable, but it is. And in addition to the portable systems, the phenomena of user-created video game modifications, commonly referred to as mods for games, continued into the start of the 21st century. The most famous example of that is Counter-Strike, released in 1999, which is still one of the most popular online first-person shooters, even though it was created as a mod for Half-Life by two independent programmers. Around the same time, In China, however, video game consoles were banned, which is quite bizarre. I wonder why they banned them. Did they ban them because they were competition? Did they ban them because it was political? I don't know. It seems like a very... (laughs) Did they ban them because they just didn't want people to have fun? Who knows? Anyway, this led to an explosion in popularity of computer games, especially MMOs. Consoles and the games for them were easily acquired, however as there was a robust grey, dark underground market importing and distributing them across the country. Another side effect of this law was also increased copyright infringement of video games. As every time you ban something, you create a brand new underground market for that product. Which is a little bit dangerous because then the products are unregulated and who knows what you're buying and where it came from. The sixth generation 
of games consoles lasted from 1998 to around 2013. In this generation, Sega exited the hardware market, Nintendo fell behind, and Sony solidified its lead in the industry. And surprisingly, Microsoft developed their first game console. The generation opened with the launch of Sega Dreamcast in 1998 as the first console with a built-in modem for internet support and online play. It was extremely successful at first, but then sales and popularity declined rapidly. This has been attributed to Sega's damaged reputation, copyright infringement, and the huge anticipation for the upcoming PlayStation 2. Dreamcast Library contains many titles considered creative and innovative, including the Shenmue series, which are regarded as a major step forward for 3D open-world gameplay. And I hope I pronounced that right. Time will tell. Let me know. Let me know if I got it wrong. The second console of the generation released in 2000 was Sony's PlayStation 2, commonly referred to as the PS2, which featured DVD-based game discs with 4.7 gigabyte capacity increased processor and graphics ability over its predecessor, including progressive scan component video connections, built-in four-player connection, available Ethernet adapter, which came built-in with the later releases, and the ability to play DVD movies and audio CDs, totally eliminating the need for a separate DVD player and making the PS2 a complete home entertainment console. It was surprisingly very successful and is now considered a classic. Nintendo followed a year later with the GameCube, codenamed Dolphin, while in development. This was the company's first optical disc-based console. While it had the component video ability of its contemporaries, the GameCube suffered in several ways compared to the PlayStation 2. Basically, it was a dedicated game console with the optical drive being too small to hold a full-size CD or DVD. The GameCube was also hindered by a reputation for being a kid's console, due to its initial launch color scheme and lack of mature content games, which the current market appeared to want. Before the end of 2001, Microsoft Corporation, best known for its Windows operating system, I'm sure you've heard of that one, and its professional productivity software, entered the console market with the, you've guessed it, Xbox. Based on Intel's Pentium 3 CPU, the console used a great deal of PC technology to leverage its internal development, making games for PC easily portable to the Xbox. To gain market share and maintain its toehold in the market, Microsoft reportedly sold the Xbox at a significant loss. And it often benefits companies to have a a loss leader at the beginning so that they can build momentum with their product. Halo Combat Evolved instantly became the driving point of the Xbox's success, and the Halo series became one of the most successful console shooter franchises of all time. By the end of the generation, the Xbox had drawn even with the Nintendo GameCube in sales globally. But since nearly all of its sales were in North America, it pushed Nintendo into third place in the American market. In 2001, the legendary Grand Theft Auto 3 was released, popularizing open-world games by using a non-linear style of gameplay, which kept things interesting for the gamers and players. There was also, around this time, a return of alternative controllers being built and made for the systems. One significant feature was a manufacturer's renewed fondness for add-on extras that they could sell to their customers. Publisher Red Octane famously introduced Guitar Hero and its distinctive guitar-shaped controllers for the PlayStation 2. Meanwhile, Sony developed the iToy, a camera that could detect player movement for the PlayStation. This was further developed into whole-body tracking technologies, such as PlayStation's Move or the more well-known Microsoft's Kinect. As affordable broadband internet connectivity spread, many publishers turned to online games as a way of innovating. Massively multiplayer online role-playing games, known as MMORPGs, 
featured significant titles for the PC market like RuneScape, World of Warcraft. All my students used to play that. Hmm. EverQuest and Ultima Online. Historically, console-based MMORPGs have been few in number due to the lack of bundled internet connectivity options on the platforms. However, once companies realized there was a market, every major player released since Dreamcast has either been bundled with the ability to support an internet connection or has had the option available as an aftermarket add-on. Microsoft's Xbox also had its own online service called Xbox Live. Xbox Live was a huge success and proved to be a driving force for the Xbox with games like Halo 2 that became extremely popular. And what about the mobile market? Well, in the early 2000s, mobile games had gained mainstream popularity in Japanese mobile phone culture. And so at that time, they were years ahead of the United States and Europe. By 2003, a wide variety of mobile games were available on Japanese phones, ranging from puzzle games and virtual pet titles that used camera phones and fingerprint scanner technologies to create 3D games with PlayStation quality graphics. Older style arcade games became very popular on mobile phones, which were an ideal platform for the arcade style and shorter play sessions. Skipping forward five or six years due to the debut of app stores created by Apple and Google, plus the low cost retailing price of downloadable phone apps, games available on smartphones increasingly began to rival the video games console market. Among the most successful mobile games of this period is Angry Birds, which released in 2009 and reached 2 million downloads within one year. And it's still really popular today. And for some, it's pretty much an allegory of their lives. But that's another story. The seventh generation of consoles appeared between 2005 and 2020. Microsoft stepped forward first in November 2005 with the Xbox 360, and Sony followed in 2006 with the PlayStation 3. Setting the technology standard for the generation, both featured high-definition graphics over HDMI connections, large hard disk-based secondary storage for save files and downloaded content, integrated networking, and a companion online gameplay and sales platform with Xbox Live and the PlayStation Network, respectively. Both were formidable systems that were the first to challenge personal computers in power. Within this generation, Nintendo not only secured its dominance in the handheld video game market, but also successfully regained dominance of the home console market with the release of the Wii, that's W-I-I. While the Wii had lower technical specifications than both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, only a modest improvement over the GameCube, its new motion control was much touted, and its lower price point of around $200 appealed to a larger demographic. Nintendo's focus on the intuitive nature of motion controls saw comparatively simple games like Wii Sports and Wii Sports Result and Wii Fit become instant hits. Many gamers, publishers, and analysts instantly dismissed the Wii as an underpowered curiosity, but were surprised as the console sold out throughout the 2006 Christmas season and remained so through the next 18 months, becoming the fastest-selling games console in most of the world. As a result, the Wii became a global success and a runaway market leader of the seventh generation of consoles, and as of September 2013, the Wii had sold... 100 million units worldwide, and is still currently Nintendo's best-selling home console. But games were not just for the serious gamers, there was also a rise of the casual player. Starting with PCs, a new trend in casual games with limited complexity and designed for shortened or impromptu play sessions began to draw attention from the industries. Many were puzzle games, such as PopCap's Bejeweled and Play First Dinner Dash, while others were games with a more relaxed pace and open-ended play. The biggest hit of the period was The Sims by Maxis, which went on to become one of the best-selling computer games of all time, surpassing the previous best-selling game, which was, if you remember, Myst. In 2008, social network games began gaining mainstream popularity following the release of Happy Farm in China, 
influenced by the Japanese console RPG series Story of Seasons. Happy Farm attracted 23 million daily active users in China. That's huge. It soon inspired many clones such as Sunshine Farm, Happy Farmer, Happy Fish Pond. I'm laughing. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous names. Happy Pig Farm. And Facebook games such as Farmville, Farm Town, Country Story, Barn Buddy. I'm laughing again. Sunshine Ranch, Happy Harvest, Jungle Extreme, and Farm Villain. The most popular social network game is Farmville, which has over 70 million users worldwide. The 2010s was a new decade for gamers. The decade saw the rising interest in the possibility of the next generation of consoles being developed in keeping with the traditional industry model of a five-year console life cycle. However, in the industry, there was believed to be a lack of desire for another race to produce such a console. Reasons for this included the challenge and massive expense of creating consoles that were graphically superior to the then generation of computers. Finally, the eighth generation of consoles ran from 2012 up to the present day. The PlayStation 4, which was billed as the successor to the PlayStation 3, surprisingly, was officially announced at a press conference in February in 2013. Moving away from cell architecture, the PlayStation 4 is the first in Sony's series to feature compatibility with x86 architecture which is a widely used platform common in many of the modern PCs. And I imagine it also made the transporting of games from one system to another system a little bit easier as well. The Xbox One is a video game console from Microsoft. In fact, I've got, I've got one right here, right next to me, right here. This was billed as a successor to the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One was officially announced in May of 2013. Microsoft had intended to implement strict controls over game resale, but later reversed its decision due to public backlash. Yes, because the gamers know what they want, and if you don't give them what they want, they won't buy it, and you'll lose a lot of money. And so in the present day, where are we now? Where were we ever? Well, Microsoft have now released the Xbox Series X, a super high-definition game console that allows most users to download and stream all the games that they want to play. That is the power of the internet and the cloud right now. Sony, in competition, released the PlayStation 5, an extremely high-powered rival, because you need to have rivals if you want progress, right? And have more recently announced PlayStation VR 2, a second generation of virtual reality that can be connected to the PlayStation 5. Together with this, the rise of online gaming platforms such as Steam, where you can get not just new games, but you can also support games that are in development as well, have led to a much more competitive nature in the gaming industry. And as far as technological development goes, well, Facebook have acquired Oculus, which is a virtual reality gaming platform. And through Oculus, Facebook have released so far four different virtual reality gaming headsets, the Rift, the Rift S, the Quest, and the Quest 2. The last of which had a surprisingly low price tag, which caused it to be extremely popular and become the most used virtual reality headset on the market. Also, the 360-degree nature of the game play and the full-body experience allowed people to finally become completely immersed in the games. And aside from the consoles, many people are using high-powered PCs to play online games. The most popular of these at the moment are Fortnite, Call of Duty, and Apex Legends. Gaming is now a huge competitive industry, and players can become rich and famous, many becoming household names themselves. And so that's it. That's us up to date with the gaming. Do you play? Is there a system you would like? Do you have a favorite system from the past? You know, I'm sitting in my room here and I'm looking at all the technology I'm surrounded by and I'm, I'm wondering, where's it all going to go next? You know what? You know what? I hope, I hope all these wires disappear and we can connect everything without wires because I'm sick of untangling them all. But that's just my little problem. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it was informative for you. If you want a different topic, please let me know. I'll be happy to include that. Don't forget, there's always comprehension questions under the video. And for sure, there'll be another topic coming to you real soon. That's it. Thanks very much for tuning in. I wish you a great day wherever you are and I'll speak to you soon. Take care, people. Take care.